Okay, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, like all good Ebola events, this has been organised slightly at the last minute. <laughs> um, we're delighted to see such a good crowd here. My name's Joy Lawn. I'm a professor here at the London School. Um, and this is a joint event between March, the Maternal Adolescent Reproductive Health Centre, and the Ebola Interest Group at the London School. Um, can I just see show of hands people who are from the Ebola Interest Group? So at least a few of you and people who are March or consider themselves March. And then lots of other people. Great. <laughs> Good. Um, so thanks so much to Shunmei Young for organizing this. So Shunmei is the co-lead of our child health theme in March. March is organized on uh, three themes through the life course, adolescence, A, births, B, and children, C. Um, and Ebola really cuts across all of those. And what we're hoping to do is to get some snapshots of early data of Ebola effects in pregnancy, thanks to what, what Ben is going to share uh, from MSF and on children, from what Felicity is going to share from Save the Children, and then talk about what the big questions are. Uh, and here we will have uh, other colleagues, including Jimmy Whitworth here from the school at Shumay, where will lead us in some discussion on that. And also our colleague from King's, whose name I'm going to forget. <laughs> Daniel. Daniel, thank you, Daniel. Um, so, but before we dive into that, I just want to flag to you an opportunity. So the London School has done some massive open online courses, led the first one on Ebola by Judith Glenn, who's here with us. Uh, that had many thousands of people sign up and uh, was really able to hit at the right time when people most needed information. Um, the most recent MOOC and the third one that the London School has done is this one on improving the health of women, children and adolescents from evidence to action, deliberately launched at the closing moment of the Millennium Development Goals, the opening of the Sustainable Development Goals. What have we learnt? What do we need to do differently? What are the big questions still in policy practice and in research? What are the data gaps? So this has got more than 9,000 people uh, actively engaging. I think we had around 2,000 comments in the first week, which was last week. So you or any of your colleagues or people in organizations that you work for can sign up at any point over the next six weeks. But it's more fun if you sign up early because the most fun thing about this course is not just the you know, active novel films and PowerPoints and so on. It's what you're hearing in the interaction from others, the horizontal learning. Um, and most of the comments last week, in fact, were coming from Africa. And you know, people in rural northern Uganda, where I was born, uh, then dialoguing with people in Bangladesh talking about adolescence. So as we go through the course, it's, it's really, I'm looking forward to learning from all these people and I would really encourage each of you, if you're here as an MSc student, it'll be different to what you get in class and it's really worth signing up for. Um, so end of advert. <laughs> I will now hand over to Shunmei and thank you so much for organizing this important event. Um, thank you very much, Joy. Um, just wanna check, is this on? You can hear at the back, okay, great. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, as Joyce says, my name is Shunmei Young. I'm a um, pediatrician specialising in infectious disease, but my main job is actually I'm a senior lecturer here in health economics and policy, um, and I'm a co-lead for the child health theme. Um, so we've put together, we have been talking about putting this together for several months, um, and finally um, it's come together. We're really happy to invite um, Benjamin Black from MSF and Felicity Fitzgerald um, to speak. Um, so the plan of action is they'll each speak for about 20 minutes um, and then we'll have a, a panel discussion where we want to try and broaden it out um, and I'll have a few kind of questions, I'll kick off with a few questions to the panel and then really want you to um, ask questions that you've been um, dying to ask as well. Um, just out of interest, has anyone in the audience been involved in the uh, Ebola response themselves? Great, okay, so we've got at least half a dozen people. It'd be great to hear um, your inputs um, um, as well when it comes to it. Um, so first we're having Benjamin Black, who's a obstetrician, 
Um, I understand you're taking an UPI, so time out of being um, a trainee obstetrician in the UK at the moment, um, to work with um, MSF, uh, and he has done an em enormous amount on um, Ebola and um, pregnancy, so we're really privileged to have you, and I know we've just caught you between trips to S Central African Republic and various other places, so thank you very much, Ben, for coming to speak to us. So, can you hear me okay? So, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. My name is uh, Benjamin Black, and as Shinmei said, I'm a obstetrics and gynaecology registrar in the UK, currently uh, out of programme, trying to get some more experience in uh, reproductive health responses to humanitarian emergencies. And I went to Sierra Leone in June last year not to respond to Ebola. I went because it was the country with the highest maternal mortality ratio in the world and part of an obstetric project which was receiving complicated deliveries for about one third of the country. Uh, but I arrived around the same time that Ebola crossed the border from Guinea and um, my mission there very quickly changed into trying to respond to both the obstetric situation and the escalating Ebola epidemic. Uh, and then I continued in Sierra Leone and assisting in the other the most affected countries in the area, Guinea and Liberia, on um, managing pregnant women who got Ebola and will soon be returning to Sierra Leone to look at the post-Ebola response again for reproductive health. And this picture on the first slide is a picture of our maternity unit. And this was not long before we made the decision to close our surgical activities. Um, and you can't quite see it, but just out of shot is the ward. Um, and a moving table um, uh, is, is the ward, which is an, it's, it's an open ward. It's a, if anyone's familiar with Nightingale wards, it's just bed after bed after bed opposite each other. So very low infection control. And um, I know some of you have been in Ebola treatment centres. Very different to to the uh, level of infection control precaution that you would need in an Ebola setting. Uh, but as you can see, these are midwives starting to prepare, learning how to put on PPE, and doing their best to try and. Um, continue what was really life-saving work in, in a very difficult situation. So before I tell you about Ebola and pregnancy, um, I want to talk a little bit about the area, the region. So the context before Ebola hit, as I said, it was very bad. And there was a WHO report that came out in uh, mid-2014, uh, and all three of the most affected countries were in the 10 worst countries in the world as far as maternal mortality ratio went. Uh, and as you can see, Sierra Leone was the worst with a lifetime risk for a 15-year-old girl of dying in childbirth of being 1 in 21. That's pre-Ebola. That's before we lost our health services. Um, the second thing is that although I'm talking about pregnancy, um, it's more than maternity. Uh, you've got to consider the wider picture of sexual reproductive health You've got to think about access to family planning, access to safe abortion care, sexually transmitted infections, HIV, gender-based violence, because all of these factors feed into what then happens with your maternal health care. And the loss of those services also have an impact on maternal health. And then the third thing I want to mention is, what was the sort of obstetrics, what was the sort of pregnancies that we were dealing with, for me, in Sierra Leone, but in all three countries before Ebola hit? It was complex obstetrics. It was difficult cases. The women that came to our center were not women just in obstructed labor needing cesarean section. They were women who'd been in obstructed labor for four days, had a fever, sometimes unconscious, sometimes bleeding. 20% of our women arrived with the baby already dead before, before arrival. So you were already starting from a place that it was very difficult um, to provide good quality obstetric care um, without an epidemic of Ebola behind you. And so, when you talk about pregnancy and Ebola, there's two sides of the coin. There's the pregnant women who get Ebola, and there's the pregnant women who just happen to be living, unfortunately, in that area at the time of the epidemic. In any humanitarian emergency, you can say that about 15% of pregnant women will have a potentially life-threatening obstetric emergency, and that's the same in this setting as well. So what, what did we do? How did we deal with the situation as the epidemic escalated around us? Well, we had a process of pre-triage, which was very similar for those of you who worked during the epidemic with the triage system that you would have had at the Ebola treatment centers. And that was a system of questions to try and differentiate between those women, uh, or in the Ebola treatment center, anybody, 
that you thought met the criteria to be a suspect, so met the case definition. And this was quite a broad criteria. It tended to be some combination of having a fever, having a contact history, and having some combination of vague symptoms. Could be bleeding, could be a headache, could be vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Well, the women who came to our obstetric unit often met the case definition by virtue of having an obstetric complication in Sierra Leone. They almost always had a fever. They almost always had some form of bleeding um, and, and abdominal pain. I mean, it, it was very, very difficult. So we would categorize this as being sort of in a gray zone. Um, so we had to make a decision. Do we uh, isolate these women as a suspect and then treat them, uh, well, test them and wait to see if they bullet a positive? Or do we bring them into our unit where there's low infection control and do invasive procedures and surgery, because quite often they would need life-saving surgery, at the risk that this might be someone who has Ebola. And to give you just a brief example, if you can imagine for a moment, suspend your imagination that you are an obstetrician in Sierra Leone, you're me, it's three o'clock in the morning, it's July when the epidemic is really escalating, uh, and you have a woman turn up on the back of a motorbike, because they often did, sandwiched between two people because she's unconscious and she's been having seizures all day. Well, we used to get three or four cases of eclampsia a day, which is a condition where you have seizures in pregnancy. Um, and you know that this is a very treatable condition. You have the medication, you have the means to save her life. Uh, but she arrives, she's unconscious, and she has a fever as well. And she's bleeding a little bit from her mouth, but she's been having fits all day long, and there's a history that she's fallen flat on her face. And what you do know is that she's come from an area where there's been a, a cluster of cases. It's three o'clock in the morning. There's no, this is, it takes at least 24 hours to get a test result, sometimes 72, because it was early on in the epidemic. Are you going to isolate her and wait for a test result, knowing that she's probably going to die before you get the result? Or are you going to bring her into your unit and give her the medication and the treatment that you need, certainly that can save her life, potentially her babies as well, but before you get a test result and risk exposing all your staff and patients? So she was, she, she was isolated, and she died three hours after and she was our first positive case of Ebola. Um, so, and this was something which became more and more common as the epidemic escalated, and it was a real, real challenge for us. Um, the picture is the operating theatre, and next to it you can see there's a sign for Ebola. Um, would you want to do surgery on someone that you thought had Ebola? If then, if anyone, so some of you have worn PPE, the yellow onesie and the apron and the face mask and the goggles. It's difficult to breathe, it's difficult to see. Now imagine doing that with a ruptured uterus and a torn bladder. It's very hot, and you've got to, and this is the sort of decisions that I was making in the early on. Am I going to continue doing the surgery where I can't really see or feel and risk sticking a scalpel in my hand, or am I going to take the goggles off so I can see what I'm doing but risk getting a splash of blood in my eye? Um, and so you, you get the idea. It's, it's very tricky. Um, for the women within the area, there were increasing problems for access to hospital. People were refusing to bring them to the unit. Motorbike drivers were scared to come to us. Women came later and later, and so our maternal mortality ratio started to go up, which meant we got more and more rumours that we were killing women or that we were giving them Ebola ourselves, even rumours that we were isolating them so we could then steal their organs. And, and this, of course, then spreads like wildfire and, and has another further detrimental impact on, on what you're able to do within the community. There was a huge amount of fear of the um, hospitals because people knew that you also had an increased risk of getting Ebola by going there because they became these amplification points. And then if anyone's familiar with the story of Kenema Hospital, but lots and lots of the healthcare workers and many patients got Ebola by virtue of being within the hospital itself. Um, and all of this, of course, increased the vulnerability of those women and uh, increased the delays it took for them to get the care they needed and, of course, increased the maternal mortality rate. And as, as Joy mentioned in the beginning, adolescents, you can't not mention adolescents because they're an intrinsically vulnerable group. So as the epidemic increased, there was a, pro a policy of closing the schools um, and the um, teenage pregnancy rate started to go up and up. Access to family planning became very low. There was a lot less uh, access and access to abortion care became very low, which meant you had further problems, further issues to deal with um, for these, these women who were just living inside the epidemic area. So what about the pregnant woman who got Ebola? Well, in many ways, they were much easier to deal with. And, and for, the, for those of us who saw the, the, the other side of the coin, we all sort of felt much more comfortable dealing in this situation because you knew they had Ebola. You knew what you were dealing with. You knew you were going to put your PPE on. You were going to isolate them. And the other thing you knew was that this baby was not going to survive. So you could focus on the woman. Um, and I say that with certainty 
because not only in this epidemic, but in all epidemics before in Uganda and Congo as well, the perinatal mortality rate for women infected with Ebola was 100%. Um, we had very few cases of live births, and all of them died within the first few days. Uh, and there's, as far as I'm, I know, there's still not yet a single um, confirmed case. There's been a few rumors here and there, and everyone looked into them. They've turned out to be a rumor of a baby that's been born to a woman who had Ebola surviving. So this is a bit of a technical slide. I'm going to try to explain it to you in the briefest way possible. But these are your blood test results for saying whether or not someone has Ebola or doesn't have Ebola. And some of you are smiling, so this obviously looks familiar to a few people. And so the, it's an inverse relationship. The higher the number, the less the, the amount of virus. Um, it's your cycle threshold, the number of cycles it takes for the amplification to detect the virus. Um, and you get two results because it's two different primers. Now, um, different labs have different numbers. For this lab at this time, this was in Kyle Lahoon on the border with Guinea, uh, to be negative of Ebola, you needed to have two, two results of 36, so 36, 36 or higher. This is a woman who's pregnant in the third trimester, almost one year ago. And you can see that when she came in, she was clearly positive. She had 29.31. Um, we treated her as we treat anybody else with supportive management. And eventually she became negative and we needed to make a decision, what do we now do with this pregnancy? Well, we know that the baby's not going to survive. In her case, the baby hadn't moved for days. So we were fairly certain that it was already dead. Um, but what we do know is that we need to deliver this woman before she leaves the Ebola treatment center. Why? because the amniotic fluid, the placenta, and the fetus itself are all teeming with Ebola virus, even when she becomes negative. And so if you look at the dates, on the 5th of November, she is negative. She's induced on the 7th and delivers. But look at the other side, the results for the amniotic fluid. This is all swabs from the fetus and the placenta. You have results of 18. That's extremely high. And these are the sort of patients who, if you worked in Ebola treatment centers, when you saw an adult was turning up with the result of 18, they're the ones you sort of looked at and thought, you're probably not going to be leaving here. Um, so, so these are very, very high. And does this continue for a long time? Well, I'm not going to go through the whole of this slide. I just want to draw your attention to the third one down. This is the number of days between the blood test becoming negative and um, when we delivered the, the fetus or the product's conception and, and the results for the PCR. So the third one down, this is a woman who had a mid-trimester miscarriage 32 days after she had a negative blood test result. The PCR for those products of conception were 22 and 29. That's still very, very high. And if you look towards the bottom, there's another one 31 days after. Um, so, so it's two things. One, we know these babies don't survive. And two, we know that they certainly have very high PCRs. Does that mean they're infective? We can't say because we haven't cultured. But the assumption is we know that dead bodies of an adult that dies from Ebola remains infectious. So there's no reason to believe that it'd be different with the body of a fetus. So the other, as the title is Big Questions, the other questions that were raised uh, for pregnant women was that they didn't always present in the same way uh, as, as your adults uh, and your children might do. We often had late presentations and, and presentations where the women would come and have no fever at all um, or no symptoms at all. They would deliver a stillborn baby and then soon after delivery, they'd then get this fulminant Ebola and then go on to die uh, or, or go on to survive. Um, we also have had a single case of a positive baby. Uh, it was a stillborn baby when swabs were taken because all deaths, including stillbirths, are tested now was positive, but the mother had no history of ever being symptomatic of Ebola. But on blood test, she wasn't PCR positive, but her IgG was positive. So it showed that she had had an Ebola infection at some point that had passed, been passed on to this fetus. Um, products of conception we mentioned, live births. We did get the odd, odd live birth, they usually died. But the, the, risk, the question is, what happens when you have a live birth with one of these women in the top two categories, they were also asymptomatic. And how risky is that to the people around doing the delivery or caring for the child? And the last thing after that is breast milk, vaginal secretions, and semen. So the, these come into the same category really as the amniotic fluid, which is this idea that you have immune privileged sites of the body, um, which, which is the theory behind why the Ebola continues within them. And we know that breast milk and semen are not only PCR positive, but they're also culturable, which means there is some sort of live virus there. And for breast milk, we don't know how long that continues for. Um, vaginal secretions were PCR positive, but we didn't culture them. It's important to bear this in mind from a, from a public health point of view to keep it in mind. So the principles of care for managing a pregnant woman who has Ebola, I'm not going to go through all, all the details of how to deliver a woman in an EDC, but the most important thing is, as I mentioned, the mortality. 
as difficult as it is, you don't need to worry about this baby, but you can save the life of the mother. And in previous epidemics, in Uganda and Congo, the data suggested the mortality rate was around 90 to 95% for, the, for pregnant women. But once we uh, started our protocols and instituted our measures, we found that our mortality rate for pregnant women was about the same as it was for the general population who were also getting Ebola. Uh, from a complications point of view, the main complication is bleeding. These, you know, bleeding is still the leading cause of death within Sierra Leone as it is within the world, and this is a hemorrhagic disease. So how can you save these women's lives inside an Ebola treatment center? You, you stop them from bleeding. You get on top of it as quickly as possible. Um, what we were doing was also trying to deliver all of them after the Ebola's passed. We weren't inducing women whilst they still had Ebola positive. Once they were PCR negative, we'd start the induction of labor. As with everything in Ebola, the safety of the staff came first. It's, you know, it's very tempting when you can see a woman bleeding, when you can see someone giving birth to want to get there quickly. It's not the case in an ETC. And this is the phrase we throw around, that there's no urgency in this emergency. You take your time, you get your PPE on, you get a buddy, you think about what you're going to do, and you do it slowly and carefully and the best you can. Um, you keep your fingers where you can see them. I don't know if there's any midwives in the room or anyone who's got such experience, but you'll know we love to stick our hands in all places that we can't see where they end up. You don't do that in an ETC. You certainly don't do it with a woman who has Ebola or who's just expelled a pregnancy which is high in Ebola virus. So we weren't doing manual removal of placenta. We were managing everything medically or externally. Um, we weren't monitoring the babies because we weren't expecting them to survive, and we certainly weren't doing any surgery. And for high risk, going into the high risk area, delivering a baby, you need to be well prepared. You need to keep it as simple as possible and efficient as possible. And how did we manage to do that? This box just next to my feet over here. And this was what's called a maternity box. And this had everything that we would envisage you would need for a delivery and the complications, which essentially was management of hemorrhage within an Ebola treatment center. We would have it packed, ready, and inside next to the woman at early stage of labor or just before we started the induction. And inside there would also have the drugs for her hemorrhage and we would tell her which drugs to take and when. Because if she delivers that baby before we get inside the Ebola treatment center, it means she can start prophylactic treatment herself to stop herself from hemorrhaging. Um, and, and we would then have walkie-talkies available for her to warn us when she thought delivery was imminent. But it wasn't necessary to be there when she's having the baby. We don't need to be there for the delivery. What we need to be there for is the time immediately after when she's likely to start bleeding. And then I put a question about emptying the uterus. Well, that was sort of a, a euphemism because what does that mean? It means abortion as much as anything else. We know that these pregnancies, A, they're infectious, what we highly suspect they are, and B, that they're not going to survive. And so we would discuss with any woman who survived that she can have the uterus emptied inside the ETC high-risk area before going home. Um, if a woman chose not to, then what we would usually do is either keep them within the ETC until they went into labor spontaneously or, or discharge them to an area very close to it and readmit her into the high-risk area at the time that she was going to have the miscarriage. Um, it would always, al almost always be a miscarriage unless it was late pregnancy, in which case we would do an induction. And of course... Uh, breast care because these are women who are lactating who have had a stillbirth so thinking about how, how do we manage that giving them drugs to suppress um, lactation or giving them a pump so that they can wean and dispose of that milk which is infectious safely and very 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 importantly family planning because we know action aid uh, came out with a statistic halfway through the epidemic that the maternal mortality rate would reach up to one in seven so family planning became a life-saving intervention. So not just women surviving Ebola, but all women within this area should have good quality access to family planning. So how bad is it going to get? Well, the World Bank said in July this year that um, gains that have been made are being wiped out. We're going to go back 20 years as far as maternal health care goes in this region. Sierra Leone, as you know, I said already, it's had the highest maternal mortality rate in the world. It had halved its maternal mortality ratio since 1990. We're now going back to post-Civil War. The World Bank saying that there's going to be an additional 4,022 maternal deaths per year as a result of Ebola. That's on top of what there was already. So in 2015, it was estimated there'd be about 800,000 deliveries within the three most affected countries. 120,000 of them will have some sort of um, potentially life-threatening obstetric complication. And when you look at the population losses, if you see the second one down, this is the health worker loss. This is only doctors, nurses, and midwives. And certainly in Sierra Leone, that's not a true picture of who's providing a maternal health care, because that doesn't include your community health worker, your, your um, community health officer. It doesn't include your um, maternal and child health aides or your traditional birth attendants. But the loss, 
uh, well, you had 50 in uh, Liberia, for example, you had 50 doctors before the epidemic started. And so the projection is that the maternal mortality is going to increase by 74% in Sierra Leone, and 111% in Liberia. Am I going backwards there? Okay. So, so what now? Well, we need to decide, are we in a, going to be in a low transmission or no transmission? Um, for pregnant women, that's very difficult to say because after the 42 days, we might still have survivors that are pregnant. And so we need to think about what that's going to mean for us. Lass of fever. Lass of fever was a problem before Ebola. It's a problem after Ebola, but no one's really talking about it all that much. But it's another viral hemorrhagic fever. It's endemic in the area, still requires PPE, and it's a problem with managing pregnant women. And we need to get back on top of managing family planning, the increase in gender-based violence, um, getting access for sexually transmitted infections, and seeing how HIV has been affected by the Ebola epidemic. And as the title for the talk was The Big Questions, I brainstormed to myself what would be my big questions for pregnancy. And I'd say we need to understand what is the pathophysiology that's going on for pregnant women in this epidemic with Ebola. How dangerous is it? There's this positive PCLs, what do they really mean for, for people who are delivering these women? Um, when is the epidemic over for women of reproductive age, both in terms of Ebola transmission, but also the vulnerabilities that have been increased because of it? How are we going to create a robust health system within these countries that were so weak to start with? And how safe do we need to get it? Do we need to think about a new type of obstetrics in the region, something minimally, minimally invasive to try and decrease the risks um, for, for the people who are working with these pregnant women having complications? And, and this is really a question mostly to myself. I'm going back to Sierra Leone at the beginning of next month. And for me, it's almost like going back to the beginning. It's Ebola's almost out, but it's not quite out. It can come back. And I'm questioning, well, what have we learned? And am I going to be in an, any different position this time round than I was last time round when it's three o'clock in the morning and I have a woman having an eclamptic seizure? And I'm just not sure. Thank you. Benjamin, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to save, uh, I'm sure people have got questions, but if you've got questions, could you just write them down? Because I think we'll just go straight ahead with the next um, presentation, um, and then we can have questions for both speakers um, at the end. But before Felicity, can we just make room? Can people move, come down, make, make a bit of space? Nice to see so many people. So let's get you. So while you're settling in, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's Felicity Fitzgerald, who's also a trainee, a paediatric trainee at the Institute of Child Health, um, who was out with the Ebola response initially with the King's Sierra Leone um, partnership. Um, and then went back earlier this year and spent several months there, but I think you'll be telling us about <laughs> it in more detail. Maybe. Great, thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Shunmei, and thank you very much for having me. Um, you can hear me all right? Good, great. So, uh, yes, I was supposed to be doing a PhD and slightly ran away last November, and um, several months later have just about returned. Um, I was working first with a small NGO, King Sierra Leone Partnership in Freetown, and then went back with Save the Children. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, the first thing I'm going to start talking about the outbreak in Sierra Leone, in particular the western area, which is the very uh, highly populated area, including Freetown, the capital. Uh, then talking a little bit more generally about the clinical features of Ebola and how that impacted on the patient flow. So what we were doing within um, government hospitals to triage patients who might potentially have Ebola. Uh, and then talk about that, how that impacted on the management of patients who might or might not have Ebola. Uh, before going on to focus a bit more specifically on um, paediatric care and the study that Shamei and I have been uh, working on for the last few months. So in terms of the outbreak so far, um, Sierra Leone has had the most cases of all the affected countries. So these are the most recent data from the um, WHO, uh, just under 30,000 cases uh, with about 11,000 deaths. But it's very difficult. The data is so messy and we still have a huge number of unconfirmed cases, probable cases that we're probably never going to get to the bottom of the exact figures that we're looking at here. And again, thinking of the outcomes of some of these patients, they're just missing. So we've got 1,500 
confirm patients from Sierra Leone alone that we don't know what the outcome was in terms of whether they lived or died. Thinking of how the outbreak progressed over time, so uh, last, this, this is 2014, the uh, outbreak originated at this nexus of three borders between Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia, and those three borders are very porous, and that is what made this Ebola outbreak different to previous outbreaks, in that there were good transport links from this um, area near Gwekadu, where they first arrived, where I expect Benjamin has been working, um, uh, to the capital cities of uh, Monrovia, um, Conakry and Freetown. And that is how the, this outbreak was able to spread. Was able to spread. So uh, December, 10th, uh, December 10th last year, which was really the, um, the high point of the outbreak in the Western area, so this big yellow dot over Freetown uh, where we were last year. And that really was kind of the peak of the outbreak in Sierra Leone. And diminishing now to these tiny little dots here, still just persisting on around that long border between Guinea and Sierra Leone. There's been a lot of difficulty in terms of getting in terms of contact tracing and things in um, Guinea, which is part of the reason why there is still a trickling on of cases there. It does look like we're winning. Uh, the depressing thing about this slide is I first put it up in January this year, and uh, it's still looking almost the same, except that the tail is going on longer. And this is, again, past that problem of contact tracing. It's still very challenging. So, um, and actually, particularly in Guinea, where it's been difficult to engage with the local population, people are still tending to hide cases. And we have these ongoing, um, they had, I think, four cases last week. Uh, and two of those were in traditional um, uh, healthcare workers. So. Uh, traditional birth assistants, I think they were. So we're still having problems in terms of getting that um, message through of um, safe healthcare in an Ebola outbreak situation. Uh, the Aberdeen hotspot is um, a, an example of how close we are with every single one of these cases to another spike. So uh, Aberdeen is a little suburb of Freetown, which is a fishing suburb, and there was one case here, a fisherman who then traveled down several villages and uh, was responsible to, for a spike of another 70 cases. So this is still not a time for complacency. We do still have a lot of work to do here. Uh, the clinical features in this outbreak, I'm not sure how many of you are physicians, but um, so it has been slightly different from previous outbreaks. The gastrointestinal symptoms have been a lot more prominent, so really profuse diarrhea and vomiting up to kind of 10 to 15 litres of diarrhea a day, more than the bleeding. So unexplained bleeding has been less prevalent, but we've seen this problem of ooze from venipuncture sites, so in about 20% of cases. Now that is very worrying if you're making a decision about whether to do um, invasive care, so using um, uh, intravenous fluids and things in Ebola, that worry that you're going to have ooze from the venipuncture sites. We think there is, well anyway, that, that's a big debate about um, uh, uh, the invasive um, uh, methods of treating Ebola, which I'll talk a little bit about later. This image is from Liberia, but could be from any Ebola treatment center. So it's this um, classical feature of Ebola patients tending to lie on the floor. So when you'd walk into the holding unit in the morning, you could almost pick out the positive patients from the door by the ones who are lying on the floor. We don't really understand the mechanism of that or what's going on, whether that's um, as a result of fitting or confusion or we're not sure. And this triad of features that were so sinister and so um, pathognomonic of um, the red eyes, the confusion and the hiccups. So again, it, it became quite easy to pick out these more um, obvious signs. The difficulty was with um, children you didn't descent, tend to see quite such a classic pictures of that. So what would happen when you came to a healthcare facility is you would get screened at the door as to whether you were well or not well, and then you would think about uh, potential contact history. So this is taken from the um, WHO uh, handbook of how to manage um, Ebola. So whether you'd had contact with Ebola, and if the patient had had a fever, and any three or more of the symptoms that went with Ebola. Now, speaking as a pediatrician, and actually in the WHO guidelines, you only had to have, if you were under, under five, you only had to have one of these symptoms and a fever in order to be considered as an Ebola suspect. So that meant pretty much you were admitting almost any child who came along. It was very difficult to differentiate between um, children who just had malaria and uh, children who might have Ebola. So what would happen is a patient would attend a healthcare facility and if they were screened at the door as positive, uh, if we had beds, they would then be admitted to um, a holding unit and then be tested for Ebola. If they tested negative for Ebola and they were still unwell, they would then proceed into the healthcare facility for ongoing treatment for their malaria or their sepsis or whatever it was, or if they'd recovered, they would then be discharged home. 
If they tested positive, they would then be transferred to a treatment center. Now, in the peak of the outbreak, there were bottlenecks at every stage of this symptom, so at every stage of this flowchart. So um, we would have problems admitting, we wouldn't have enough beds to admit people, so they would have to wait outside to get admitted if we, if we considered them suspect patients. It would take an average of two and a half days to get your result back for your Ebola test. So that increases the length of time that these people are in contact with these people. So again, raising this risk of um, possible amplification within the holding units. Although, as I will go on to say, we're not, the data doesn't look that convincing that um, there was too much infection within the holding units. This is Connaught Hospital where I first worked. Now, um, you, one of the problems with the, um, that initial screening flowchart is, of course, asking somebody whether there's been in contact with Ebola. Now, this must have been a very unusual time of day that um, the photograph was taken, because normally outside Connaught Hospital, which is the busiest hospital in Freetown, I think, one of the busiest hospitals in Freetown, it's the only tertiary referral centre in the whole of Sierra Leone, and there are normally hundreds of people milling around here, so uh, patients, relatives, uh, traders, taxi drivers, everything, and all the people who wanted to come into the hospital had to stand in a big queue here and uh, be asked very loudly, have you been in contact with anyone with Ebola? And not surprisingly, a lot of people lied. Um, so it was very difficult to pick out from that contact history whether people had actually been in contact with Ebola or not. Um, at the point when we were very busy, we weren't able to, we didn't have enough beds within our holding facility, so people would have to wait in this tent. Um, and uh, for various political reasons, we weren't allowed to put any facilities in the tent at all, so not even a bucket. And people would sometimes, well, at least have to spend overnight there and sometimes longer. So um, I did call it the tent of doom. And this is the reason that the, one of the reasons that um, the uh, holding unit model was developed. These are um, uh, testimonials to healthcare workers who died in Connaught Hospital, so doctors and nurses who died of Ebola during the outbreak. If you don't have some way of protecting your hospital, so making sure that those sick people you're bringing into the hospital don't have Ebola, then you're putting your staff at a, a horrific risk. So doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers were at 103 times the risk of the general population of catching Ebola. So unsurprisingly, they, wouldn't want, they didn't want to come to work. You had to find some way of making them safe. And the, health, the holding unit model was developed as kind of in response to that. So that would, it would provide that facility of making sure that you, well, trying to make sure that you weren't admitting patients with Ebola into your um, main hospital. So uh, this is uh, Connaught Hospital Ebola, Ebola, uh, Ebola Holding Unit, which was 18 beds built and run by King Sierra Leone Partnership. And um, you can see here that it is within an existing facility. And this is one of the features of a holding unit is that you don't have unlimited space. You've often got quite a small amount of space and you have this ongoing trade-off of wanting to bring as many people in who you were suspicious of having Ebola to your holding unit, so protecting your community on the outside, and also wanting to maintain um, infection prevention control within your unit. So uh, having good ways of isolating people, having space around your beds, as simple as that, having these plastic sheets that we use to um, divide off the bed spaces and things, but space was at a massive premium. Um, we were busy, so we had about 52 admissions a week. And um, just within Connaught uh, holding unit, they uh, isolated over a thousand patients, of which um, uh, about half were positive. Some of the challenges faced um, faced within running running a holding unit. So um, uh, most of the treatment centres have fairly good security to prevent people getting out and people getting in, uh, and also to warn um, people around about the potential dangers of it. Um, the security at Connaught was this plastic vent here, and you can see it is, so our holding unit is these three windows here. Uh, so you can see there isn't a big, there isn't a huge amount of space between um, your patients with Ebola and the rest of the hospital. Um, pigs, there are lots of pigs in Freetown. Sometimes we found pigs in the tent. Uh, and more um, worryingly, so this is the view, I'm standing just at the border of Connaught Hospital looking down at um, uh, Crew Bay here, which is one of the most um, overcrowded chanty towns in the whole of Freetown. And uh, we would get little furry friends that would run up from Crew Bay into our holding unit and then out the other side on the little boat covered pools. And we have no idea what, how that potentially impacted on transmission, but it was another lurking worry in our minds. 
Now, this is where I then went to work. So this is a purpose-built um, Ebola treatment center. So most of the photos that you would have seen previously have been from these, um, uh, in the media, have been these purpose-built Ebola treatment centers by MSF or this one by Save the Children. And you can see there is a lot more space. You can plan what you're doing. You can map your, flow, your inflows and outflows more easily because you're building something from scratch. Um, and you tend to have a lot more staff. So this was the first time that Save the Children had run an ETC, and it was um, billed as a flagship ETC. Um, uh, it had a laboratory on site, which was wonderful, and we were aiming for a high level of care. So we were aiming for giving aggressive care, giving intravenous and intraosseous fluids. Uh, we had an extensive formulary, we were very spoiled, and had things like oxygen concentrators, which in the smaller units, with, um, in the holding units, was an impossibility. Um, we managed 280 uh, confirmed EVD patients, of whom about half survived. So that pretty much matches out with the, um, uh, the rest of the outbreak. Uh, another little um, comment of how the treatment centers versus the holding unit. So this is a very, uh, the process of decontamination where you take off your personal protective equipment is a massive hot potato for Ebola workers. So whether you do what is um, uh, a wet decontamination, which is the example here, this is the um, uh, Save the Children one, which follows the MSF. Uh, route of spraying people, or whether you do, this is me in the um, slightly more budget um, dry version, which is using a Veronica bucket to wash your hands afterwards. Um, and you can debate these. At the moment, as far as I know, there isn't actually any evidence one way or the other. It tends to be what you've done first is what you most hotly believe is saving your life. Um, but I don't think that as, I don't think as far as I know, we've got any evidence as to which one works better. And again, just to illustrate a bit more, this is the goggles versus visors debate. Again, a great way to start a fight between um, uh, Ebola workers. So you've got the, um, the heavier method of PPE here on the left uh, with the goggles and quite a thick apron and uh, the lighter version here with um, aprons and a visor. Um, so this is what the guidelines were for how we were supposed to be managing um, Ebola that came out in uh, last November. And I put this more up in uh, kind of terms of how aspiration could fall very short of um, the reality. Uh, we were we were able to give um, antibiotics and antimalarials to most people. It was the idea of managing to get zinc and vitamins and anti-helmets and everything else in as well was really very difficult. I think that... Um, I mean, in particular, even it, with the Save the Children in the, their ETC, we, were, we found it difficult to always be on top of the analgesics, the anti-emetics and everything like that. So in the, sm in the smaller, less um, uh, sophisticated units, it really was very challenging. I think for me, this is my first kind of venture into humanitarian, um, humanitarian things. So it, was, it has been fascinating and a massive learning curve, I think, for all of us, how there really has been this big shift from the very from the very kind of public health agenda of um, we are doing isolation and protecting the community so we are going to admit people and do very hands-off minimally invasive care to uh, now what I think really should be accepted as the um, uh, the standard of care for Ebola patients uh, pregnancy being an exception that we should be aiming to be able to give aggressive medical care to these patients because if you're having 10 to 15 liters of diarrhea a day you're not going to ma they are going to die if you just give them ORS and given the level of expertise and the level of experience we've had now I think it's it's impossible to argue that you should be doing minimally invasive care we need to we need to get on top of giving these uh, giving IV fluids to these patients Specifically speaking as a paediatrician, this photo for me really illustrates some of the key difficulties of um, working as a paediatrician in um, uh, looking after people with Ebola. Now this, this, just the way that he is holding this patient, that hand so close to your face gives me the heebie-jeebies and I'm sure it would give other people who've worked in treatment centres the heebie-jeebies as well because all it takes is for that little one just to go and your goggles are off and you've been exposed. Now, and also this guy looks like a monster. So PPE is flimsy. It's scary, and particularly if you can't speak Creole, you look and sound like a monster as well. Uh, and it's hot, very hot. One of the things, so when I was talking at the beginning about um, admitting children to holding units, you can see that we would have to admit a really large number of children according to that um, thing of having you know, a fever and one symptom. 
Because of the perceived risk of potential infection within a holding unit, most holding units would refuse to admit a caregiver with the child, so the child would have to come in by themselves. And that's because you'd worry about the mother contracting Ebola and then going off and giving it to her other five children and the rest of her family. Which then meant that, of course, we had this host of unaccompanied two-year-olds or six-month-olds or ten-year-olds or eight-year-olds um, who were very challenging to look after. I mean, as paediatricians or as people who are involved in looking after, children, looking after children, you know it's difficult to get a sick child to um, take Dioralite like, because it takes, tastes horrible. And if you're trying to do that in the brief bits of time when you can get into, um, uh, with, so we would only be allowed in for sort of 45 minutes to an hour and you've got lots of other duties to attend to as well. To, you wouldn't have the time to sit with the child and spoon feed them bit by bit or syringe in a bit at a bit a bit and a bit as a normal as a mother would with the um, ORS so it's very difficult to look after them and of course in a holding unit separation is key so you can't have um, what w would happen with these children is of course they would be lonely and they'd run around and they'd go and talk to the person in the bed next to them or even if they weren't ambulant and you could just put them in the cot when it got to two in the morning and the poor little thing had been crying all night the people in the bed next door would pick them out and give them a cuddle and again that we worried so much about the risk of cross-contamination with that it was really very difficult to manage now this issue of transfer distances so particularly early in well early in the peak of the outbreak in um, uh, Sierra Leone so around September to November we didn't have the capacity to look after all the Ebola positive. We didn't have any bed capacity in Freetown, actually, in early September to um, look after these confirmed Ebola patients. So they would have to be transferred very long distances to the other side of the country. So at least four, perhaps six hours in the back of an ambulance, which is essentially just the back of a van. You're not having um, clinical care that's given in the back of these vans. And it would often get very hot in those um, and those ambulances and as anyone who's looked after children clinically will know it's a bad idea to put a sick child in an ambulance for 15 minutes let alone for six hours with no care potentially except just a bottle of ORS so um, back in November we had a mortality rate reported back to us from um, Kenema of 60% um, in the mortal in the ambulance alone so 60% of the people that we were sending to Kenema died on the way that's adults and children so with children, what do we know so far? Well, we know it does. there does seem to be a mismatch of the number of children who um, contract Ebola compared with the distribution of the population. And I've not seen any good explanation as to why we see that. So it seems that less children um, get Ebola than you would proportionally expect given the um, uh, population distribution of the country. That may be due to underreporting, but again, we really don't know. Uh, there is a high mortality rate for under fives. Uh, once children get to school age and a little bit older, it looks more like adults. But uh, particularly for very tiny babies, as Benjamin has been saying, it is extremely high. Um, the only published paper so far about paediatric data has talked about a shorter incubation in children. I think this is very difficult. If you consider the number of children who are coming unaccompanied to the holding units, I mean, it's impossible to get a symptom duration onset from an unaccompanied two-year-old. And a lot of these children were coming by themselves in ambulances by themselves. So it's really difficult to get good figures about um, what potential contact uh, history was and things for these kids. And the symptoms do seem to be less specific. So we see less of those um, really characteristic um, hiccups and conjunctivi conjunctivitis in children. So, yeah, very difficult to pick them out at the door. It would happen a lot that I would think a child just had a cold and was going to get better and they wouldn't get better and then their test would come back positive. So it really was difficult to pick them out. So, um, Shunmei and I decided we wanted to find out a little bit more about what was happening with these children. So um, we set up this cohort study that I ran with Save the Children. And our primary aim was to look at what was happening to those EVD positive children and trying to follow them up from the holding units to the treatment centres. There was very poor communication between the holding units and the treatment centres or in general throughout, like between the um, uh, different people who are providing care. So if you were just working in a holding unit, you'd never know what happened to the people who you sent to the treatment centres. And if you were at a treatment centre, you didn't know what had happened for the previous at least two days, but perhaps more, that a child has been receiving antibiotics and antimalarials in a holding unit. But also, we really want to look at what was happening to those children who were admitted to a holding unit, but actually probably had malaria or sepsis or something like that. Um, and what, firstly, what, whether they had a risk of contracting Ebola, but also to see 
what being admitted to an Ebola holding unit would do to the mortality or mortality rate, say, of something like malaria, so what the impact of being admitted to a holding unit was. And to try to investigate a little more what was happening to these children. So, yes, when they got readmitted with Ebola or um, uh, whether they were going to survive or not. We would have loved to have done it prospectively, but we were a bit slow off the mark. So it was a retrospective observational cohort and looking at all tw under 12 year olds uh, in that Western area, attending um, 11 of the holding units from, um, yes, August 2014, so March 2015. So hopefully covering that kind of the bulk of the outbreak in the Western area. And we were lucky with our collaborators. So um, we managed to get quite a lot of um, uh, people engaging with us, which was very good. Um, we were mostly going with paper based records. But also things like whether a child was unaccompanied wouldn't routinely be documented. The, re the way we were able to get that information was often from uh, the staff working in the holding units themselves because they would remember how difficult it was to look after the six month old who was crying all the time or the eight year old who tried to escape over the fence. So you could, you could pinpoint that kind of information quite well. The problem with that is of course that data has a very limited lifespan. So we were really keen to get on it and ask those questions as soon as we can before the staff dispersed or forgot. We tried to triangulate with uh, phone follow-ups to the relatives if we had their mobile numbers, uh, child protection records and uh, burial records as well. Uh, and cross-referencing cross that with the command centre. So the command centre was set up in collaboration with uh, King Sierra Leone Partnership and the um, Sierra Leonean Ministry of Health to try to organise and coordinate that transfer of patients between holding units and um, treatment centres and uh, disseminate laboratory results as well. And again, we were lucky with uh, people who shared data with us. So these are very preliminary results. We're still in the stage of uh, cleaning and analysing the data, but we've managed to recruit uh, just over 1,000 children, of whom uh, 310 tested positive and 750 tested negative. 40% um, of the ones who turned out to be EVD positive were unaccompanied. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the problem that we're dealing with here, both in terms of the reliability of the history and what on what that... Um, uh, the fact of being unaccompanied would um, impact on these child survivals. We've managed to get outcomes in about 90% of those, which is great. Uh, and of those 90%, we've got about a 57% mortality rate, of which half occurred at the holding units and half at the treatment centres. So you can see how crucially important it is to put those two pieces of data together, because if you've only got one, you've only got half the picture. So really interestingly, in our preliminary comparison of the EVD positives versus the EVD negatives, of the EVD positives, only 30% of them had a documented contact history. Now, of course, they all of all have had um, uh, contact with um, Ebola in some case in order to have got it. But partly that's a problem with documentation and um, partly that's a problem with um, these children coming unaccompanied. So it's impossible to get a contact history from them. Uh, and interestingly, so did 10% of those EVD negatives. We still really don't understand transmission within family groups and how that can work. And that's another big ongoing question. Now, encouragingly, you remember I was talking about the possibility of um, holding units being um, amplification sites for Ebola. One hospital, it was very, one hospital refused to let any healthcare workers in overnight because they were worried about transmission to their staff. So this is in their holding unit. So they insisted on caregivers coming in with the children. And this is despite the potential risk to the, to, to, um, the mothers. So we have a group of um, children who did come with their mothers. And We've managed to contact just about 100 of those mothers and or those caregivers who came in with their children. And very encouragingly, none of those were admitted with Ebola. But of course, we don't know about the ones that we couldn't get hold of. So we still need to do some quite detailed sensitivity analyses for that. And I think that's really fascinating and important because even with those 100 women that we have managed to get hold of, they spent at least 48 hours in a red zone without any PPE and the personal protective equipment and didn't get infected. And I think that that is really important when we're considering the risks around red zones and trying to understand how this virus is transmitted. Um, that particular holding unit was beautiful. It was built by the Germans with advice from places like King's and it had a lot of space. And I think that probably contributed to um, how things uh, turned out to be, appear to be safe there, which is great. So ongoing work, we still have got a bit of analysis to do in terms of factors impacting outcome. And we're particularly interested in those um, uh, potentially modifiable things. So the health system factors, the question of um, uh, children being accompanied or not. Because if you can demonstrate that 
there is an improvement in um, uh, mortality if those children are accompanied, you can use that to lobby, say, for em employing survivors to work in a holding unit just with the remit of looking after children. We generally believe that survivors are at a much less, probably zero risk, as long as they have no other comorbidities of um, uh, catching Ebola. Uh, and then these clinical and management factors as well, whether what we were able to do say in more aggressive centres like um, uh, say the children's ETC did have an impact on uh, the outcome of these children. We have a lot of unanswered questions and um, particularly around those the impact on those children who were turned out to be negative for Ebola and um, interesting Benjamin being um, that there are rumours of um, baby survivors but no clear things and I I would love I would love to be able to say no I've got a baby who definitely had Ebola and definitely survived what I have is a mother who died when the baby was six day, six days old a baby who was admitted to a treatment center for six weeks and is now six months old and well but that baby never had a test and we'll probably never know whether that baby had I know <laughs> um, we know the mother had Ebola we don't know if the baby did or not but the baby did survive six weeks in a treatment center which is quite impressive and this just goes to underline the problems of poor documentation the, the difficulty was is when everybody was so busy one of the things that got put very low down the priority list was writing anything down and trying to go back and fish out through these little chlorine covered pieces of paper and you'll go to a holding unit and ask them if they've got any records and they're like no 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 and then they're like oh well maybe and open a drawer and it's bulging full of documents but um and oh we were just about to bin these ones because these were from the people who tested negative we didn't think anyone would be interested in that and that you know those kind of things when you're like oh god please no like so those have been some of the things that we've just been that we've been working on when we've been out there and to finish on a high this is a wonderful slide so um these two are two of our nurses from um uh, connaught hospital and this is the day that they were discharged as um, ebola survivors so, uh, and they are both still working in um, Connaught Hospital. They're great. And thanks to all my collaborators. I should have put Shin Mei in bigger font. Sorry. <laughs> Felicity, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful um, talk. And I'm sure people have got lots of questions. Um, can we assemble the panel. So while you're getting ready, um, so as well as Felicity and Benjamin, we're being joined by Dan Yuki, who is an, a, an accident and emergency trainee who spent a long time out in Sierra Leone and um, was, amongst other things, I think responsible for helping to set up and convert health centres and hold, hospitals into holding centres and I think has a, a interesting um, I, I'd be interested to hear some reflections on your your take on the impact um, on the health services. So we thought with the panel, the, the presentations have been quite clinical, which is what we intended, um, but we thought maybe with the panel it would be interesting to have a slightly different perspective, um, a bit of discussion on kind of health services impact. Um, Jimmy um, Whitworth is a professor here, um, has worked in Sierra Leone for a long time, an epidemiologist, and also responsible for um, London School's research um, agenda in Sierra Leone. And I was hoping that Jimmy would also give us some reflections, either from the research perspective or kind of from an epidemiological perspective. And I've got a couple of questions um, for the panel, um, but I'm sure uh, it'll be, you've got lots of questions yourself. So I'm going to hope that the microphone works. And, um Does this work? Yeah. Do you want to Shall I just shout? Um, if I shout, can everyone this? hear me? Yeah. Perfect, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Danny Yuki, um, thank you for the introduction, Shun Mei. So I was the Ebola Holding Units Coordinator um, for King Sierra Leone Partnership in Freetown in, from September 2014 through to July 2015. You've seen these holding units in Felicity's presentation. Um, so these were isolation units based at government healthcare facilities, so based at pre-existing government hospitals, which is slightly different to the traditional method of response. Now, these units in Freetown, they isolated 1,200 positive cases of Ebola. So we saw quite a lot of Ebola at the units, but it also allowed us an insight into the general healthcare services. So we could see the impact that Ebola was having on 
antenatal clinics, on unplied clinics. And really, from August onwards, August is kind of is really when Freetown was engulfed um, by Ebola. In August, all the healthcare workers went on strike. Your doctors, your nurses, even the medical students went on strike, and I think they're on summer holidays. Um, everyone went on strike, and there were really no services being provided. Gradually, people came back to work, and some of the community started to access services. Benjamin talked about fear and rumours before, and fear of being infected with Ebola whilst going to a hospital meant that we saw probably about a 75% drop in presentations at the sites that we've looked at, and also an increase in severity of those coming. So only the really sick came to hospital, um, and a lot less of them. Now, we've focused a lot on clinical parts of Ebola, but if you've seen any of the recent modelling papers, they predict that twice as many people may have died from malaria and lack of access to malaria care than died of Ebola. So those broader impacts of the Ebola outbreak are really quite important to look at and study. I guess my question um, as we're going on is, how does the traditional method of response, so a large treatment centre, um, pioneered really by MSF, who do a wonderful job of that, how does that protect normal healthcare services? How do we stop those normal hospitals becoming places of A, nosocomial transmission and amplification of the outbreak? And B, how do we protect healthcare workers? We know that in Sierra Leone you're 100, over 100 times more likely to catch Ebola if you're a healthcare worker. And Benjamin showed us how much of an impact that's had on healthcare workers in the country. And they really are a finite resource in Western Africa. Thanks, Jimmy. If I shout too, can you hear me? Great. Less excuse, okay. If I'm deafening at you, tell me. Um, so, just to summarise what, what I think we've, we've heard, um, with children, there does seem to be something of a lower attack rate, Le less susceptibility to Ebola than seen in adults. And this is odd, and we don't understand this, um, from work that Judith's done, um, it looks like there might be a fourfold difference between under fives and those over 35. Now, is that reporting? Um, are we talking about societies where perhaps young children are less valued than uh, working adults? Or is it something to do with less exposure or to <laughs> some sort of more robust response to um, the infection? We, s we simply don't know at the moment about this. And I think this is important for, for uh, research in, in the future around this. Um, if children are infected, they do tend to get a, uh, a higher case fatality rate. Um, we see that particularly in the, in the very young children. Um, we also see it in uh, very old adults. By very old, I mean more than 45, um, who t t seem to have a, a higher mortality rate. Another important thing for children is that it's hard to diagnose. The early stages of Ebola are uh, just the same as you'd see for malaria, for typhoid, for measles. And that makes it a, a, a very challenging clinical problem that we have. Um, for pregnant women, um, they seem to be as susceptible to Ebola as uh, non-pregnant adults. Uh, normally you get higher case fatality rates. Uh, Benjamin has shown that if you've got specialist units and you uh, really pay attention to this, you can bring that down to the same as non-pregnant adults, which I think is an encouraging and positive message. Um, it's fatal for the fetus and for neonates. There are ongoing worries about health care and how one can provide that for pregnant women in these circumstances, and I'll come back to that. And this is mainly around amniotic fluid and uh, products of conception being so uh, highly infectious. The secondary effects of the epidemic on a collapsing health system are greatly outweigh the number of 
direct cases that there are from Ebola. Um, there's going to be more malaria, there's going to be more diarrhea, more pneumonia, there are going to be less vaccinations and we start to see um, little epidemics of measles coming up now in the countries concerned. Um, there's going to be less maternal care um, and more maternal deaths, albeit from starting at a pretty low level uh, in, the, in the first place in, in terms of care. How big a problem this is, um, I don't know. I think it's clear to say that it far outweighs the direct deaths. We've seen some of the data presented. I'd be sceptical about the solidity of the basis for many of those, and for particularly the differences between, between the countries that, that are there, which don't seem to make much sense to me. But I think the general point is it far outweighs the problems that we've seen. And I think there is a, a real problem that we're facing now about how we rebuild from that situation, rebuild health services with an ongoing epidemic. People have questioned whether it is realistic to set up health systems at all in the face of an Ebola epidemic. Um, as has already been mentioned, health centres can be wonderful incubators for an epidemic. If you bring together lots of febrile children um, all in one place and there's an Ebola epidemic going on, what's the likely outcome of that? And this is dangerous not just for the patients, this is also dangerous for the health workers as well. And this is recognised in the region. At the moment, um, as the epidemic goes down, there is increasing belief and trust in the health systems from the, the, the populations of, of Sierra Leone, but it's only at around 50 to 60 percent at, at the moment. And of course you can set up nice systems and you can reassure people that it's safe, but they will vote with their feet. And I think uh, at the moment uh, it, it's a real problem that we have as we, we come through the, the, the cusp of the epidemic. And really, um, I think we can only safely uh, re-establish health systems once we have got to zero cases. Uh, even then, we have this worry about the potential for sporadic cases to occur again from um, sexual transmission or from pregnant women. So um, I think we, that is the big problem that we have at the moment. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, just following on from that, actually, that's quite, um, that's quite a scary, worrying statement, I think. Um, and I was wondering if actually any of the people who've, any, any peop any, anyone else would like to reflect on that in terms of what you think in terms of the rebuilding of the health services? I guess my, I guess my first reflection on that is, um, which was echoed in, in Benjamin's talk, I think, is do we wait till zero? And is zero achievable or will that goalpost move? We worry about it becoming endemic in the region. We worry about ongoing transmission. At the moment, with the lack of a point of care diagnostic at the front gate of every healthcare facility, people still need to be screened. And as we've seen both in pregnant women and children, the symptoms are so broad and the, co and the case definition so wide, it captures all of them. Um, so I think some type of screening and isolation needs to continue and healthcare services need to get back up on their feet now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly something which is on my mind a lot as I'm preparing for going back to look at how we can restart maternal health services. Um, and I think that one question, as I said at the end, is, is how safe is safe and, and what is the reality that we're going to have here? Um, you know, this epidemic was different. This wasn't the first Ebola outbreak in history. We've had Ebola before in Uganda and Congo. The difference was that it was in a region that hadn't had Ebola and that it was crossing uh, international borders and it got into urban areas. Once the epidemic, once we cross that 42 days and we see a lot less cases, as Danny said, is it going to be necessary to continue to have the same um, level of triage at all the time. Because as, as a colleague of mine was saying to me the other day, 
in Congo, where you do have sporadic outbreaks, you don't have you don't have the same level of triage at, at all the time, and, and, and they are continuing maternity services, for example. I think that um, one of the problems that, that we're going to face is that the population is incredibly traumatized um, within this area. And I think that not just from a medical point of view, but also from a psychological point of view, um, it's going to be necessary to continue for quite some time uh, a very high, a high level of um, triage to, to reassure the population uh, and, and to really give time for the trauma as well to start to settle. Sorry, one more thing before I'm sure you guys have got some questions. I think the real game changer here would be a uh, sensitive and specific point of care test. Uh, both, I mean, particularly for obstetrics in terms of urgency and for pediatrics in terms of the difficulty of um, diagnostics. If you've got a point of care test that you can know in a couple of hours or maybe 20 minutes even whether this person has Ebola or not to like a high degree of, um, with a high degree of certainty, then this debate sort of diminishes away and I don't think we're that far away from it I mean there are several that have got really quite good results I know Danny was working on one that had um, good sensitivity and specificity so um, I think when we get past that then these debates will change good point Felicity thanks very much Jimmy did you want to say one more thing I did and that is I think we need to avoid Ebola exceptionalism um, we, we talk about um, how safe is safe. Um, it's never going to be completely safe. It never was completely safe to provide health care or go to health facilities in, in West Africa. Um, Benjamin, I think, mentioned uh, Lhasa. Uh, you know, in, in eastern Sierra Leone, in, in Liberia, uh, Lhasa's been endemic there um, as far as anybody knows. Um, and there are other nosocomial infections. Um, healthcare workers uh, catch TB at much higher rates than the, the general population, for example. So I think we have to get the, uh, the Ebola in, in perspective. Quite difficult population, many health workers have been very traumatized by this epidemic and it is going to take time for people to get over that. Thanks very much. Okay, ready to turn it over to the audience. Um, who's going to volunteer first? I think we've only got. I don't think this one. I think we've only got one. So, Neil, would you mind? Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi. Um, this might be a really stupid question, but I was just wondering if. One of the reasons, perhaps, that um, small children seem to be less affected was because they're less likely, especially if they're very small, to be caregivers. Thanks. Hannah, that's a great question. Just to say, Hannah was in Sierra Leone for a long time with us, coordinating the uh, telephone, um, uh, the 117 response team. So I had a, an excellent background in Sierra Leone. I got a bit worried seeing you coming in in case I was saying things wrong. But um, so no, I think that's a uh, that is a good suggestion. I think one of the things in this outbreak is there's been an awful lot of um, young men were at a very high risk, and young men aren't caregivers. We, that has led us to believe that there's probably a lot more sexual transmission that goes on. So this is young men from the age of sort of 19 to 35 who were... Associated with burials. Sorry? But that could be associated with burial practices. Yes, yes, it could be. I mean, I suppose we're thinking here more when we were trying to, when we believed we had more safe burials in Freetown and we were still seeing large numbers of um, uh, young men and young women come in. So yeah, so at that point we, we would certainly have hoped that they weren't sort of these like big nexuses around um, uh, funerals. Uh, but no, I think that's a very good question. I still slightly believe that perhaps a lot of these children were just, were just being buried in the back garden. I'm not sure. Um, I think that we will get some kind of an insight into that if anybody ever has the chance to look at all those lab results that were done on swabs of stillbirths and things there's that that data is there but we just haven't had the chance to look at it yet um, I think that would give us some kind of an insight as to what level of these um, children did have Ebola or not when we finally got to look at that anyone else want to commit any epidemiologists or other people in the audience want to postulate why there's been such a 
Judith, I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to tempt you. <laughs> <laughs> Necessarily answer that, but just to point out, it's not just young children who are spared, but actually it's a fairly linear incidence going up to a peak at around 35, and then levels off. So you're getting a lower incidence in the sort of 20 to 24 year olds than the you know, 30 to 34 year olds, which doesn't really fit the statistics mm. in caregiving, mm. and it's all almost identical for males and females. Thank you. study, yet another was launched in Freetown today about this. Um, and obviously there's been an influx of people coming into Sierra Leone trying to now to do different things um, and different approaches, um, behaviour change communication, radio programmes, um, all sorts. So I just wondered uh, how you think, what could be the best ways to encourage women um, to attend for antenatal care and so on, obviously there are challenges as well, um, but in post fellow response, um, and how to use and trust these services. That sounds like one maybe for either da Danny, Danny or and I can start, I guess, um, and maybe Jimmy could talk a bit more on this, that there never was a huge amount of trust in healthcare services in Sierra Leone. When universal health coverage came in for, well not universal, for pregnant women and under fives, there was a lot of informal charging for these services because healthcare workers weren't being paid enough. So they were making up through informal charging for either antenatal clinics or vaccination clinics. <coughs> there are some very ambitious plans in terms of rebuilding the healthcare system and very strong promises that have been made by the Ministry of Health and international donors on how healthcare workers will be funded and treated. It looks at, like a dream. <laughs> and anything that can keep uh, the ministry and international donors to that, I say, would help regain trust. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's difficult to say what's going to be the magic bullet um, to, to make everything better from a maternal health point of view, because maternal health, as you know, is already incredibly poor at the outset. Um, there was already quite good attendance within community for antenatal services. In Sierra Leone, it was getting much better that people, uh, the number of women who were attending, this is before the epidemic, at least for several uh, antenatal visits, but there was a huge problem still in access to obstetric care around the time of delivery. Um, and that's still going to be a massive challenge for, for lots of different reasons, um, both uh, from a human resource point of view, but also to a geographical point of view and a economic point of view. Um, there is now, as you've said, a lot of NGOs that are sort of scrambling to get into the post Ebola response and certainly um, reproductive health and maternal health is one of the big, uh, big ones to go for. The hope is that they will coordinate their response and work together. Now, if you've got experience of NGOs in a humanitarian emergency, you may be slightly sceptical or cynical as I am, whether or not they're going to manage to coordinate as well as, as they could do, um, but that, that remains to be seen. Hopefully they will. I think all I'd add to that is that time and the building of um, a reputation and trust is going to be important. This isn't going to be something that is resolved rapidly. Um, good uh, community engagement and involvement is clearly important in, in that as well. Um, but also the avoiding of any public relations disasters um, you know it, it takes a long time to build a reputation but that reputation can be destroyed overnight if something terrible happens um, got one question here I think it was first and then there and then Can you hear it at the back? Sorry, just want to check. Can you hear it at the back? I'm not sure if that's. Nice. 
Okay, I'm Jane Cooper. I'm a public health doctor who's been at the LSE doing social psychology. So I'm interested, very interested in trust and distrust. Um, it occurs to me that there are about uh, some tens of thousands of Sierra Leoneans in London. I wonder if any are here and whether they've got any comments to make. Um, great, you're next. <laughs> there is um, an organization called uh, Toshpa. They're having a fundraiser at the end of this month. They've got a website. They're working to improve infection control facilities in hospitals. Thank you. Um, my name is Brian. Um, during the Ebola outbreak, I, uh, when the Ebola outbreak started, I was working in the district, but I changed jobs. I moved to HIV, so I had very, almost nothing to do with Ebola. Um, but um, the question about trust, with the um, building trust, um, for so that um, mothers, uh, pregnant women can come back to um, health centers is something I can contribute to because my w I worked for three years with the free healthcare program Jim was trying to mention. And um, one of the problems with that program was that, yes, the program was advertised as free. There was no um, charge, but most times the services were not being rendered. Mostly there were no drugs at the facilities. If there were drugs, they were not adequate for the number of people that um, were meant to access those facilities. I think maybe by getting more drugs and more services and facilities, that could build trust with the communities. Because if someone goes to a facility and gets treated and gets drugs, she tells that to her peers, they will be running to go to those facilities. I think that's what I'd like to say for now. Yes. Hello, um, I am Mohammed, and I actually was I was working as a medical officer when the Ebola outbreak started. I was working for a private facility, Choi Rams Memorial Hospital, but I was fully aware of what um, a colleague there mentioned about people the strike which occurred somewhere around August. Because doctors were being infected at an alarming rate and personal protective equipment were not readily available. So people were generally concerned about their own personal safety. Most of us, I mean, if you look at the doctor population in Sierra Leone, vast majority of them are people in their early 20s, 20s to 30s. They are very, very young people. These are the people like the man in Connaught Hospital, for instance. So people were very much concerned about that. Those things were not readily available. So that was one of the major concerns. I also worked as a surveillance program officer engaging communities. I think one of the primary factors responsible for finding out this outbreak was where the initial mixed messages. The messages were not uniform at the onset. If you tell community people, for instance, Ebola, out, Ebola if you contract Ebola, then your chances of survival is zero. I mean, the people would naturally think of, I mean, Sierra Leoneans, we have a culture of largely wash, uh, washing our dead. We are very religious people. We wash the dead body and we have our various funeral rites. And we see people coming into our communities, put people in body bags. I mean, that is quite different from what we've used to. So if you tell people that you contact Ebola, then your chances of survival is zero, then people will think like, if I get this disease and I'm put in body bag, I would rather stay with family where I'll be given the necessary funeral rights as and when I pass off. So that was a very, very key challenge. And um, I think even before the Ebola, as my colleague rightly mentioned, the health system was largely dysfunctional. But again, these were things that were not very clear because we all knew there were problems, but the extent of the problem, we, we, would only, we, we were only able to clearly appreciate them when this outbreak struck. 
you know, because IPC was a very key challenge in Connaught before now. I mean, there were no running tabs. In fact, for us, I used to work at a private clinic, so mm -hmm. there are IPC as infection prevention and control practices we are quite apt, but in Connaught Hospital, for instance, that was a very, very key challenge. So that, again, went largely in contributing to the nosocomial infection amongst healthcare professionals. So these were some of the key challenges we saw. And another thing, again, with respect to interventions, you know, we had several non-governmental organizations which came in, they wanted to be brought in, they came in with some very brilliant uh, initiatives. But again, in doing any community-based intervention, the entry point is very crucial. You know, so those were some of the things, again, those are things that should serve as part of the lessons learned. We know the moment we incorporated the traditional leaders, the mommy queens, that these are the women leaders in the communities, we saw that attitudes largely began to change. And the very fact that we've seen a downward trend in the epidemic is as a result of the intervention of some of these people. So again, intervention strategies, people, the entry point into communities is also very critical. That is something that should serve as a lesson going forward. Thank you very much. Ex excellent, um, excellent point. Actually, it would be really nice to hear um, any, any other voices from the affected countries. Um, I know we have a couple of people waiting for questions as well. Okay, let's go to the next um, question. Hi, thanks. Um, this is a great talk. I am wondering about, um, there's been a significant media response in the rest of the world to the Ebola outbreak, even though, as you said, the secondary effects, the increases in malaria, the poor access to health services, um, probably have a substantially larger impact on the health of um, that region. Do you think that any of the sort of momentum from the Ebola response and international donors will be able to sort of be carried forth into health system strengthening and infrastructural strengthening? And if so, um, what do you see as sort of the most, the highest priority areas um, as the focus shifts into a broader um, sort of approach? <coughs> Great, thank. Uh, firstly, I think you guys are incredibly brave. You know, y you genuinely are heroes. Um, one of my friends uh, also went out and worked in a in a better center, and I've heard his talk. It's equally powerful. Um, when you're going out, you're going out into a situation where you are uh, going into, uh, you know, these centers with the PPE and things. How do you think your mindsets or perhaps the mindsets of other potential volunteers might change when the situation is moving to this more recovery phase where perhaps you're going into hospitals without wearing PPE and that knowledge that not only is there malaria and Lassa but also the potential for, you know, a local outbreak of Ebola? Okay, thank you. And then Um, hi, R I'm really happy that I managed to come to this uh, presentation and, and see what uh, that things are, are moving forward. I have a question specifically about the, you know that during the whole response, the information and the the, the messages that were passed in between colleagues, uh, uh, actors, and also the population were very confusing. Especially any guidance that became official was becoming obsolete that very week. So, and I th consider that it's going to have a very long-term effect on the, the way that people approach health services and, uh, and they, the trust they can, can put of them. Is there any idea on how much is going to affect or, or, uh, or there are any measures to try to counter this kind of really popularity of messages that may uh, also like the base for lots of rumors and misconceptions. Great. Thanks. So we've got three quite different questions there. So you can take your pick. One kind of about health systems, uh, lessons learned, what can be learned and in priorities for going forward. Another question on, as volunteers, 
you know, what's, what's, the, uh, what's, what's going to be the impact as things go into the kind of post Ebola phase in terms of how uh, kind of, I guess, preparedness for um, volunteers. And third one about, um, do, are we aware of any efforts um, to, I guess, coordinate um, and improve the, um, the messaging? Is, is, that, is that right? <laughs> okay, so starting with Jimmy, how would you like them? Um, the first question, I, I think that um, <clears throat> in general terms, certainly in the UK, the media response to the epidemic and the, the stories that were coming out were very measured and very balanced and very good. I think, I think that was well done. But it's dropped out of the news now. Um, and <clears throat> when I talk to people, they're often quite surprised that there is still an, Ebo uh, an Ebola epidemic going on in West Africa, that it hasn't gone away because they haven't heard about it for, uh, for a while. Um, and I think that is um, uh, one of the, the symptoms one sees of a, a, a news machine, that things like that do, do, do die down when they're not perceived to be quite as um, alarming and as newsworthy as before. And I think this is going to be a problem with rebuilding of, of health services. I don't think that's going to be a very sexy topic for uh, news desks to get there. And indeed, if people have good ideas about how we can make health services sexy, uh, then please do let us know because I think this is something that's going to be difficult to galvanize the, 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 the general population about. Um, <coughs> maybe I can respond to the second question. Um, what's it going to be like now where you have uh, the tail end of the epidemic but as you mentioned there's less fever and there's the possibility of cases coming back. Um, I think for me it's going back now would be very similar to how it was at the early part of the epidemic when it was escalating around us. Um, when I've spoken with colleagues of mine that were in Sierra Leone at that time, uh, so around June, July, whilst we were still trying to continue normal maternal health and paediatric services within the epidemic around us, for those of us who then came back again specifically as part of the Ebola response, we all had the same Im uh, impression which was we didn't realize how difficult and how traumatic it was to be doing general health care with the epidemic around us till we came back specifically for Ebola. Uh, and I would say that it's, it's much more frightening and it's much more difficult uh, and psychologically as well, it's much more um, trying because you're constantly second guessing yourself, like with the example that I gave, but that's every day, all day, every patient that you come into contact, but also their relatives, and also the people that you're meeting when you're walking through the community. I mean, now it's, it's different because we're, we're going downwards. So I'm, I'm talking about when things were getting worse. But certainly I think that's still going to be an issue, and, and I think it's going to be something which is going to take time before, um, well, before the, not, not just people going into, the, into these countries, but the people living in these countries start to feel comfortable and secure again um, in gatherings and, and in being in close contact with people who have whatever conditions going on. Uh, hello. <laughs> in terms of media, I can't really comment on UK media um, being out in West Africa. Perhaps a quick comment about our, which media we choose to use in West Africa, and if there's any anthropologists or Sierra Leoneans, you might be able to shoot me down. In Sierra Leone, the Ebola, the main Ebola promotion song, starts with President Ernest by Karoma tells you about Ebola, okay? And he educates you about Ebola. Perhaps in Guinea, where you've seen some of the lack of trust within communities, a lot of this is related to the political situation. And I think you can trace some of the areas where Ebola carried on in Sierra Leone and some of the more affected areas to perhaps be areas which were not supportive of the political party and the media that was, was largely a state-sponsored media. Um, in terms of long-term gains for health system strengthening, health system strengthening isn't sexy, as Jimmy said. Um, I think there's been a major commitment to improve IPC, so to improve IPC in government hospitals such as Connaught Hospital, and you can definitely see a better supply chain and more awareness. I think the other thing in terms of building a more resilient healthcare system is that, especially in Freetown in Sierra Leone, 
it was largely a Sierra Leonean-led response. You now have healthcare workers, doctors, nurses who have seen a lot of Ebola, know how to do surveillance, know the importance of IPC, and they're still there at those healthcare facilities, and they will continue to be there. So you have a lot of institutional memory. Uh, some of what I was going to say just got pinched. So um, uh, I will say, I mean, thinking just a bit more about like the, psych the psychological impact of doing more normal um, healthcare. I think that one of the things that was key from rebuilding the health system is the things that Danny and Benjamin have been doing on the ground and will be doing on the ground is um, to do with role modeling as well. And I think that was, that was very important in terms of trying to get IPC services um, instigated in government hospitals and things, the mere fact that you are, hopefully, if you've got gloves and an apron, putting on gloves and an apron before you go into a ward. And that, in terms of the health system strengthening, was another thing that I really hope will carry on, that um, King's particularly has been doing a lot to do with um, IPC in these government hospitals. And um, I think if we can train the nurses and also make sure we keep that supply chain going of making sure they have methods of protecting themselves. That would certainly help me psychologically going into um, a, a more normal ward, but hopefully give them the confidence to carry on working as well. Simple things. Just um, to, to answer the third question, um, because there was a question about these changing uh, protocols through the epidemic and, and, and how that's affected people. I think what it's important to say is that this was a very dynamic situation, the epidemic. It, it wasn't static, it was changing all the time. Our learning curve was changing and the response was changing. And so it's, although it may have been confusing in some ways, it was also natural that you were going to get different protocols coming out and that they were going to change. Certainly, if I think of my experiences in uh, July, August, when we were one of very, very few, uh, well, MSF was virtually the only NGO in the country at the time with the large treatment centers, we had about 10 expatriate medics with about 40 national staff and an ETC of just over 100 patients. Later in the epidemic, you had several large, large treatment centers where your ratio, staff, ratio, staff to patient ratio was completely the opposite way around. And so the level of care that you could provide changed. And then, of course, you did have this debate, as Felicity mentioned, about what level of care does that mean? How interventionist can you go? Well, well, that debate opens up when you've got the capability to offer that. Um, it's an interesting debate. I don't, personally, I don't think that it's necessarily lost the trust um, of, of the people. I, I think that uh, there was a relative understanding that this was a changing situation. The epidemic started small, it got large, the response got large. Um, it wouldn't be one of my major concerns personally. I'm afraid the time has come. Um, we're running 10 minutes late already. Um, thank you very much for um, coming. I'm, so thanks to our speakers, Felicity and Benjamin. Thank you very much to our um, additional panel members, um, Dan Yuki and Jimmy um, Fitzgerald. I'm going to hand over um, to Joy for the um, final um, closure. And I will make my closing very quick. I want to particularly thank Shun May for setting this up. Uh, and I want to really thank all of our four speakers. So I think they deserve a big round of applause. <laughs> and I just want to, I want to make the interesting observation that we had this whole time without mentioning the vaccine. <laughs> so I'd, I'd just like to observe that. And I, and I think that's an interesting reflection on the depth of the reality of the discussion about the devastation on individuals, on health workers, on the system, the data that we have seen. But I hope that as well as that reality of that devastation, you'll also leave with some thought about what we do. So I just want, I just want to pick out three things. One is the innovation agenda. So Felicity's asked for an instant, perfect, perfectly sensitive point of care test. Please, any takers. <laughs> Nobody really mentioned the vaccine. Then we've talked about the health system issues. And then we've really talked a lot about the critical issue of trust. So as someone who uh, was born in East Africa but worked a lot in West Africa, the trust is critical, but I think it's interlinked with the data and how we use the data in the public domain. And I think we should be very careful about some of the data we've heard here. So as someone who's uh, a paediatrician who's worked in West Africa, but I've spent most of my professional life on the neonatal and stillbirth data, I would be very cautious about thinking what the 
uh, infection attack rate is in these children where you know most of the births were already at home. Um, I would be careful with that. I think we've got a big missing denominator here. So I think a critical point, we're in a research institution, what are the things we can do? We can think about the innovation agenda. Yes, we definitely need to do differently on the data. And please, I appeal to you how you use the data too. So I've heard maternal health mentioned lots of times here. I would appeal that we also use the neonatal. So Sierra Leone for the last five years has had the highest rate of neonatal mortality in the world. The number of neonatal deaths in one day in the world is more than the total Ebola deaths. And we've been saying for five years that's a very sensitive indicator of health system weakness. You know, if a system can't look after a baby, that system is failing. Uh, so please use that data as well. And then I just want to leave you with one of, I think, the most shocking and devastating lack of hope pictures here. So not one single stillbirth was averted, not one single neonatal death. You know, every single woman who was pregnant expecting new life you know, had no hope, not only little hope for herself, but no hope for her baby. And the moment our protocols are to leave that woman if she's hemorrhaging, to not do anything for the baby. Um, so, you know, how are we going to change that, both in the trust and the upstream prevention and the innovation, but also in what we're able to do? We have to do that differently, and we have to keep this in front of people's viewpoints. <laughs> So the power of the data, you know, whether health systems are sexy or not, people are frightened of things coming into the UK. You know, we have to find ways, you know, definitely are reposting people, putting money into Sierra Leone that's meant to be a post Ebola reconstruction. It is upon each of us to use the data to make sure that that investment, which is an investment from British taxpayers, the investment from USAID and, and CDC is huge too. It is up to us to use the data to ensure that that actually reaches where it should reach in the way that it should, and to make sure that we take every opportunity to hold people accountable for that, and it takes data to do that. So thank you.